Thank you, Irina, for your invitation to speak, and thank you, friends, for listening to me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I must begin my presentation with two apologies. First of all, I must apologize to the translators because I have failed to supply them with any clue as to what I'm going to say. And in advance, I offer them my profound apologies and ask forgiveness. And I would like to thank them for the excellent work that they have done throughout this conference, which has enriched us very much. <clears throat> Secondly, I must apologize, dear friends, in advance to all of you. Throughout the course of this conference, we have heard presentations from theologians, psychologists, educationalists, uh, liturgists. Uh, we have heard uh, learned opinions of all cinematographers, no less, dramatists, teachers. I'm afraid that I can offer you no competition to these learned uh, presentations. I am simply a parish priest and all of the work which I have done, which Irina has just described to you, um, has come to me, if not by accident, then certainly not by my own choice. Metropolitan Callistos of blessed memory, who was known and loved by many of us here, when I went to visit him in the week before my ordination as a priest, gave me two pieces of advice. You know there's this custom of would-be priests going to ask their teachers and their spiritual fathers for a word. Bishop Callistos gave me two pieces of advice. First of all, he said to me, never pretend to be anything other than the Englishman that you are. <laughs> Secondly, he told me, as a priest, don't go looking for work for yourself to do. God will give you exactly what you need to do, and do that as best as you can. <clears throat> well, now I'm trying to do it as best as I can, if my voice will hold out. I must also apologize to you that in the context of this presentation, you will, I'm sure, hear nothing very new or original. I am, by nature, a recycler of other people's ideas and opinions. And this may have some pastoral use. I'm reminded of another story that Bishop Callistos told us in his lectures when we were students of a famous preacher who would begin every sermon by making dramatic gestures. First of all, he would do this, and then he would do this, and then he would start to speak. And on one occasion, one of his audience asked him, why do you start every sermon with such strange gestures? And the speaker replied, ah, well, you see, none of, my material, my, none of my material is original, and these are the quotation marks. <laughs> so allow me to present you with many other people's ideas now. You've asked me to speak about bringing up children in an orthodox family and to give some reflections <clears throat> from life in my own parish. In order to do this, in fact, I think it is necessary to tell stories. Human beings are, in the words of H. Stephen Shoemaker, an American Baptist, homo narratus. We exist and we relate to one another through telling stories. And each one of us and whole groups of us have our own story, our own narrative. 
my own training as a priest at the hands of Metropolitan Anthony of Souroj was basically two years of going every two weeks for a day to hear him tell me stories. Sometimes Metropolitan Anthony's stories were not exactly true to historical fact. They had a habit of changing over time. And on one occasion, it was very difficult because if you were listening and you heard these stories, he would sometimes look at you and say, you must stop me if I am boring you. And of course he said, no, Vladika, you're not boring me, please continue. But on one occasion, I actually uh, uh, became brave enough to say to him, well, uh, Father Anthony, he liked us to call him Father Anthony. Father Anthony, you've told me this story before, but in the previous version, it was in a completely different setting and with completely different protagonist. And he simply looked at me and smiled with mischief in his eye and said, ah, well, I forget. <laughs> we are all creatures of story, but again, as the psychologist Eric Kandel points out, each time we relive our story, it reconfigures itself in the context of the perspective from which we remember it. We are part of a living story. And in our families, <coughs> our story and our living that story are important. In fact, the story that we are trying to live from the perspective of Orthodox Christians in a family is the story of the gospel. <clears throat> Here I was so encouraged to hear Lena's stress on imagination. How many times we are told as Orthodox that imagination is something dangerous, that we should shy away from imagination, that we should not develop our imagination. And yet, if we enter into the liturgical pattern of the Orthodox Church's worship, we see over and over again an encouragement to resort to our imagination. If you think of some of the hymnography of the great feasts of the church, today is the beginning of our salvation. Brethren, brothers and sisters, let us take ourselves to Bethany, to the Mount of Olives, to the upper room. We are encouraged to enter into the story of the gospel. And in the words, in fact, the dying words of a great saintly figure of the Orthodox Church in Europe in the 20th century, somebody who has now been almost completely forgotten, Archimandrite Denis Chambon. You've never heard of him, but he was a saint. Father Denis' last words, in fact, were as he closed his eyes and surrendered his soul to God into the new life of eternity, it is only the gospel that matters. So if we're going to begin to look at orthodox family life, I think we must begin by looking at living the gospel. Let me just ask you when I must finish speaking, because my talk is flexible. <laughs> Seriously, we have to go home, we have to have supper, and we can go on till about 20 past six, I guess, right? Good. <clears throat> if human beings are homo narratus, I think we must parallel this by saying that we are also, if I can put this correctly, homo eucharisticus. The Western liturgical scholar, Dom Gregory Dix, Sister Vass has heard of him, and she may even like some of the things that he has to write, Dom Gregory Dix, a Western scholar, uh, calls us a Eucharistic man. And the 
Western Anglican theologian, Archbishop Rowan Williams, somebody who is very sympathetic to orthodox theology and spirituality, expands upon this when he says, to we as human beings are called to become a human species that makes sense of the world in the presence of the risen Jesus at his table. I remember once hearing a very lively presentation of one of our previous speakers, Father John Bear, meditating on the theme of Christ and the two disciples at Emmaus. This lively encounter, which involves both listening to the story, an explanation which begins to take life and is realized in the life of the risen Lord Jesus in the table of the supper into which the disciples invite him as a partaker. Stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is, far sp is nearly spent. <clears throat> Father John makes the point that at the moment that the disciples' eyes are opened, Jesus vanishes from their sight not because he has abandoned them, but because at that Eucharistic moment he has entered into them and they become the body of Christ, the church. One of my parishioners once, uh, after the services of Holy Week, as we were sitting and having coffee after the liturgy, asked, when was the first liturgy celebrated by the disciples after the resurrection? Well, this is that moment, the Emmaus meal the first liturgy, and we are encouraged as families to enter into this Eucharistic mystery in the course of our daily life. <clears throat> Let me tell you a little bit about my family and about my parish. When I was 18 years old and I arrived at Oxford as an undergraduate, I never imagined that I would become a parish priest and the father of five children. I had joined the Orthodox Church as a teenager. I think I was a fairly horrible teenager, actually, to my parents. Um, and I had discovered Orthodoxy as a young child. My parents finally allowed me to join the Orthodox Church much against their better judgment when I was 16 years old. And my journey to Orthodoxy was closely connected to my growing acquaintance with a hermit hieromonk, Father Barnabas, who was a significant figure in my formative years. So when I went to Oxford as an undergraduate, I understood that this would be for a brief period. I would finish my studies, go back to Father Barnabas, whom I loved dearly, become a novice and a monk. We have in English the proverb, man proposes but God disposes. And so it was that the first person that I met on arrival in Oxford as an undergraduate was the girl that I married. So I did not become a monk. And my mother sometimes reminds me of the fact that when I was a child, I always said that I hated children and I could not understand how anybody ever could possibly think of having any children. So now I find myself with five grown-up children and fortunately, yes, we all speak to each other still every day. We all love one another. And we are, in many ways, very similar and in other ways, very different. The same can be said of my parish. I am the priest of one of now five Orthodox parishes in Oxford worshipping in four different places. When I was a student, we had two or three, two and a half parishes worshipping in one and a half places. So the Orthodox community in Oxford has grown over time. 
My parish belongs to the Moscow Patriarchate, but is by no means a Russian or Russian-speaking parish. It is international. It follows very much along the same principles that Metropolitan Anthony of Suraj had in trying to promote what one might call generous orthodoxy. Orthodoxy which remains faithful to its tradition, but is open, creative, missionary-minded, and tries to express through its existence the subornist, the unity in diversity of the church. In fact, if one wants to look at the question of families, I think we need to look at parallels between the structure of the family, of the parish, and perhaps even of monastic communities, because there are, in all of these cases, things that are shared in common. I've always been a great believer in the principle of finding connections rather than finding things that separate. Human beings, by definition, are good at drawing boundaries and creating barriers, but the Holy Spirit calls all into unity. And the prayer of Christ to his heavenly Father before his crucifixion is that all of us may be one. In parish life, monastic life, family life, all Christian community life, let us perhaps start by using as our model the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity, which we were reminded of in our very first uh, presentation yesterday, is a model of relational unity, of unity in diversity, of creativity, of mutual freedom and mutual obedience. We might say, if we are looking for a model for our family lives or our community or even monastic life, along with the Russian 19th century commentator Nikolai Fyodorov, our social program is the Holy Trinity. Let us look at some of these principles one by one. We often hear in traditional manuals of how to raise children in the Orthodox family of the importance of obedience. And it's curious to me in looking at traditional manuals of how to raise children, how many of these works are written by monastics who have no personal experience at all, <coughs> often of having raised any children, <coughs> excuse me, and also who, sad to say, sometimes have extremely negative memories and experiences of their own dysfunctional childhoods and family relationships. So it's not surprising, perhaps, that when we look at instructions as to how to raise children, we come across the notion of obedience, order, and hierarchy. And in the church, too, we cannot escape the fact that obedience, order, and hierarchy are part of the overall picture of what it is to be the church. But we might ask the question, what kind of obedience what kind of order, what kind of hierarchy. Let everything be done decently and in order is the instruction of the Apostle Paul. And for that reason, perhaps, sometimes we see in some parts of our Orthodox Church an unhealthy obsession with a very linear, almost autistic, order at the expense of all things. You all know it, the kind of parish where the gospel has been replaced by the ustav, the typikon, the rules, where our church life has become rather more old than New Testament. <clears throat> 
let us remember that obedience in all of the languages that we use in our traditional church practice has a direct connection to listening. Obediens in Latin, Paslushanie in Russian, Ipakoi in Greek. All of these have an implication of listening. And what it is to listen in the context of family relationships is something very important. <clears throat> I think for the first 10 or 15 years that I served as a confessor, I made the mistake of thinking that I had to have something to say to everybody. And perhaps after that time, which coincided to the, a large point with my own seeing my own children grow up, I came to the understanding that listening is probably most important. Again, another story from Bishop Callistos. He told me that as a young priest, rather in the same way when he started to hear confessions, he thought that he should have something useful to say to everybody who came to him. And so it was that one Saturday evening after the vigil service, an old Russian parishioner, very venerable, very established, came to make his regular confession. And this young priest, many years his junior, began to give him words of spiritual instruction. Bishop Callisto said, I was somewhat surprised to discover that after a while, the person making his confession turned around and said to me, Father Callistos, be quiet. <laughs> you are here to listen. <laughs> and I think that there is much to be said for this. We might think of that story in the Old Testament when the child Samuel is staying in the temple with the aged Eli. You remember the story from your childhood, I'm sure. He hears the voice of God calling to him and thinking it to be the elder goes to him and asks him what he wants only to be told that he did not call him. Ultimately, the old man Eli tells him the next time you hear the voice say, speak Lord, your servant is listening. And I think that this is a correct way to understand the mutuality of obedience, not only in our relationship with God and one another in the church, but also in our family relationships. Families that listen to each other and that speak to each other grow strong in their relationship with one another. Some of the most frightening examples of utter dysfunction that I have found in families during my years of pastoral service as a priest have been with families that have grown so silent that nobody ever speaks to each other and there is no element of discussion or communication or mutuality, only instruction and order. And I think the same could be true of parishes and of monastic communities also. Hierarchy. We are perhaps in some parts of the Orthodox world used to the idea of hierarchy as determined by medieval feudal models, a hierarchy of power and rule and perhaps we might say sometimes blind obedience, a militaristic hierarchy. Let us remember what Archimandrite, now Saint Sophroni, tells us about hierarchy. Much um, 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 repeated by people and often um, misascribed to other speakers, but it is Father Sophroni's original notion. 
of what we might call the inverted pyramid. Yes, Father Sophroni says, the church is hierarchical, we cannot escape that. But in its hierarchy, the church inverts the triangle so that instead of having a triangle of rule and power with each degree lording it over that underneath, the triangle falls on its fulcrum, on its point, with each bearing the burdens of the other. In the context of the church, he means in particular according to the uh, ordained ministry of the church or those who have responsibility for the management and order of the church. But he says that ultimately at the point of the triangle is Christ bearing the burden and the weight and the sins of the whole world upon the cross. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. This is what the Apostle reminds us of in his epistle to the Galatians, and we might apply it to our church life, to our family life, to our community life. If we talk about bearing one another's burdens, we might go on to consider the importance in family life of compassion. And here again, I was delighted to hear Lena's uh, story about the welling up of compassion from within the very depth of one's being that can come through reading and imagination. Let us, if we are to raise our children, teach them the strength and the power of compassion. We remember what St. Isaac the Syrian says in one place when he reports a conversation. An elder was once asked, and I'm sure that you will remember this famous passage from Isaac. An elder was once asked, what is a compassionate heart? He replied, it is a heart on fire for the whole of creation for humanity, for the birds, for the animals, for the demons, and for all that exists. Actually, compassion is not something that comes naturally to our human condition. We heard about nature and nurture. Nurture is actually perhaps more important than nature in a sense in that it is the ability to nurture that really is one of the shaping influences on our humanity. And it is through nurture and being nurtured that we learn compassion. I would like to turn now to looking at the notion in the family and in the community uh, of communion. I mentioned earlier of these two strands, the story and the meal. Dom Gregory Dix, who I mentioned earlier when he describes the divine liturgy, the Eucharist, says that ultimately, and this is a paraphrase, ultimately the divine liturgy is basically a Bible story and a meal. Well, in our own families, we know of the importance of stories and meals. I think that those of us who have raised small children remember from their very earliest years how central in the daily routine were the elements of reading the bedtime story and getting together to eat, basic aspects of our human condition in the family. Of course, we, from an orthodox perspective, look at communion as something sacramental. But the sacrament has implications for the rest of our ordinary life. 
At the end of the Divine Liturgy, we are given an instruction, let us go forth in peace. The grace of the Divine Liturgy cannot be contained within the walls of the church, and those of us who come to church in order to escape the world misunderstand our momentary laying aside the cares of this life. Communion in the context of the Divine Liturgy is something which connects not only between ourselves and God, but between ourselves and one another. It is perhaps significant that in the words of the Eucharistic prayer, at the moment of the epiclesis in the Divine Liturgy, the priest prays to God, send down your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts here set forth. And it is upon us first that the request is made. So our Eucharistic communion is something which has both a vertical and a horizontal axis. It is cross-shaped and finds its culmination in that sacrifice of the cross. We as families might think about this in the context of our daily life. I think of the words not of an orthodox hymnographer but of a Protestant, a member of the Salvation Army, Albert Osborne. I'm sure that many of you don't know anything at all about the Salvation Army, but it is a Protestant denomination that is entirely non-sacramental and non-Eucharistic. But looking at the place of the Last Supper in life, Osborne in one of his hymns says, my life must be Christ's broken bread. My love, his outpoured wine. That other souls, refreshed and fed, may share his life through mine. So our families, in order to find their Eucharistic fulfillment, must also be prepared to go out into the context of life in the world. We are called to be missionary in our family relationships as well as our church order. Let us go forth in peace. Sometimes we are, as families, frightened of the world. Frightened that our children will be corrupted. Frightened that they will learn the wrong things. We've heard so much about the dangers of the internet, of social media, of phones, even though paradoxically we are the ones who buy our children those phones. And we don't think too much about the creative possibilities that come from embracing the world, which, though fallen, is good. How many times in that creation narrative which we've heard about today does God say, uh, does the author of Genesis say, God saw that it was good? Our world, though fallen and broken, is essentially good and remains as such. If we want to combat a toxic world, let us first learn to sanitize, no, that's not the right word, disinfect our toxic families. Because actually the toxicity that most people experience in their lives, which damages them, comes from within, not from outside their families, I'm afraid to say. Let us, in the words of the Apostle Paul, hold fast to that which is good and abstain from every form of evil. It's not rocket science, it's quite simple really. There are so many other things that I would have wished to have shared with you, but I'm afraid we run short of time. I would conclude by remembering the words that Father Alexander Schmemann says in one of his letters to somebody talking about the Orthodox Church and people within it. 
when he says with acerbic wit, right church, wrong people. <laughs> Let us in our family relationships and in our parish communities embark on a process truly of education, of learning to become not the wrong people, but the right people. We have heard a lot about education, about the different aspects of education, formation, training, but I would like to leave you with the thought again of the um, semantics or the, is it semantics or etymology? Etymology of the word education. Educare, to draw out. We in our families have the ideal opportunity to allow one another, to help one another, to draw out that which is good and to hold fast to it and to turn away from that which is evil. As the psalmist says, turn away from evil, seek peace and pursue it. I wish you, dear friends, that in your families, in your communities, in your relationships, whether you be monastic, family person, or a single person in the church, that you find the opportunity to speak and to listen and to enter into the story of our eternal salvation. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I think uh, we have a little bit of time for questions or comments before we uh, break again, before the concert. Just. Thank you, uh, Father Stephen, uh, for reminding us of the importance of uh, talking to one another, whether it's in the parish or in the monastery or in the family. Basically, this is just a thank you. Um, I wanted to, uh, you know, just express my sometimes annoyance at the kind of romanticization, if that's a word in the English language, of... Uh, silence all the time. You know, I think that this culture of the having everyone having their nose in the phone also at the family, you know, dinner table, um, that there is a silent, you know, the silence can also kill relationships and be a little bit of a passive aggressive, you know, punishment of your loved ones. And uh, sometimes within our church, I think we keep partly also because of our um, <clears throat> uh, internet age, we keep each other at bay and don't talk in real time to one another. You know, you might get a message, even if you live in the same house from someone from the upper floor, and you might, uh, you know, you have time, which sometimes is a good thing to respond, but not responding to one another in real time um, and losing the ability to communicate um, and read the icon that is the person, their physical presence, uh, you know, it makes us come to a sort of, um, I think right now in this divisive time, um, it, it brings us sometimes into a dead end with those with whom we're challenged still to find subornist, still somehow to, uh, you know, with, to find um, a common language uh, and the common, the unity in Christ. So anyway, I just wanted to say thank you for reminding us of the importance, not of silence in some cases, but of talking. Thank you, sister. I think that silence and speaking make sense of one another. In fact, if we do not allow for periods of silence between the words, the words make no sense. But if we simply have an empty silence, not the still small voice 
that Elijah experienced when he encountered God, but a dead silence, there is no sense there either. And it strikes me that a good model of balance here is found in Luke's Gospel, and for that matter in John's Gospel, by in the image of the Mother of God. We hear on more than one occasion in Luke's Gospel that Mary kept all of these things and pondered them in her heart. She stays silent. In fact, for the majority of the Gospel narratives, both in John and the Synoptics, Mary is silent. But when she speaks, boy, does it make a difference. Every single word counts. And she speaks in the gospel, as in the church tradition, with boldness. They have no wine. She speaks to Christ in the way that only a Jewish mother could do to her son. They have no wine. What are you going to do about it? And then she speaks to the people. Do whatever he tells you. And at the cross, she remains silent while he speaks and commends her and the evangelist to one another. And the silence speaks more than any word could do so. And this boldness is something that perhaps might inform both our silence and our words. Many of us through the period of COVID, when we had time for silence that we perhaps would not have wished upon ourselves, had the opportunity to think, to repent, and to look back over our lives. And as I'm sure many of you did, I looked back over my life with sometimes great shame over the sins and offenses of my past life. But I have to say that in spite of some of the big mistakes that I have made in my life, my greatest shame was for the times when I kept silent and should have spoken, or for the times when I spoke and I should have been silent. So the two relate to one another, and I thank you for drawing our attention to that.